from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. A record-breaking gilt sale. We have $340 a pound. $345. Anybody else? Sold it. A community comes together to honor one of their own and make sure the legacy lives on. Farmer sentiment improves. The egg economy barometer rose six points this month to a reading of 103. We dig into what's behind the change as high heat and little rain leads to an early harvest in portions of the South. Right now on Ag Day. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. Corn harvest is underway in portions of the South, and if that sounds early to you, well it is. In some cases, harvest is running about three weeks early. Braden McInnes sharing these pictures of how harvest is going for him right now near Cairns, Texas, the area southeast of Dallas. Now at the time that he took these photos, he tells us it was 110 degrees, and he tells us the yields are about average at roughly 115 bushels an acre. Well, we did see some rain, but unfortunately in the south, that's generally too late for this corn crop because Everything happens earlier there. We've already gone through reproduction. We're well into grain fill. So for Texas, we actually saw a decline in condition. That is the nation leading 50% of the corn crop rated very poor to poor in the Lone Star State. Not too far behind is North Carolina at 42% and Tennessee at 38%. Now, there was plenty of rain last week in North Carolina and Tennessee, but again, that rain coming too late for corn. Meanwhile, corn harvest is also underway in the South Delta of Mississippi. Eric Larson of the Mississippi State University Extension taking this photo. Drought conditions not as severe in the state with 29% of the state abnormally or moderately dry. And some recent rains have helped firefighters battling a blaze in Northwest Oklahoma, a state almost entirely covered in some sort of drought. The fire known as the 217 fire broke out at the end of last month near Moreland. Now it's reported that ranchers in the Moreland area were impacted by the blaze and are in need of hay to feed their animals. But the rain has passed and now the heat has turned back on in Oklahoma. That hot and humid weather in the Midwest will soon be stirring up some storms. Meteorologist Matt Urasavik joins us with an update. Matt? Yeah, Clinton, that's right. We've got more heat, more humidity in the middle of the country, keeping temperatures feeling closer to or just over 100 degrees. You can see those highs here. Four later this afternoon, over 100 there in Tulsa, down into Dallas, and in the upper 90s all the way across from Chicago to Omaha. That's what it's going to feel like when you add in not only the high temperatures, but also that humidity. Now, out ahead, there is a cold front, and that's going to be bringing the chance for some stronger storms all the way up from northern Michigan down through parts of Indiana, Illinois, and even back into Missouri, where we could be looking at some heavier downpours as well. So not only gusty winds and heavy rain going to be the main cause of all of this chance for stronger storms this afternoon, but if we take a look here at the excessive rainfall for today, many of those same areas highlighted where we could see training thunderstorms and heavier thunderstorms at that, which could produce locally upwards of two to four inches of rain or even more than that. So again, another flood threat going on through parts of the Great Lakes and into the Midwest as well. And wheat harvest continues to roll on and it's yielding some spectacular photos. Corey Cress of Rockland, Idaho, capturing this spectacular image. Right now, 14% of the winter wheat has been harvested in the state. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. Drought conditions aren't just confined to the U.S. England just experienced the driest July since 1935. Forecasters say the country has received just 35% of its average rainfall for the month. In France, well, it experienced its driest July in more than 60 years. Officials say the country is at an 88% moisture deficit. France saw a record-breaking heat wave back in July, which brought wildfires across the western and southern parts of that country. Farmer sentiment bounced in July, according to the latest Purdue University CME Group Ag Economy Barometer. The latest reading climbing six points month over month to a reading of 103. Researchers say the increase was driven by improved outlooks for both current and future expectations 
Farmers, well, they still consider it a bad time to invest in those big capital improvements. When asked, 44% say the increase in prices for farm machinery and new construction is the reason to keep money in their pocket. If you look at the barometer, the current condition index, and the future expectation index, they're all down nearly 25% compared to this time last year. U.S. farmers remain concerned about a wide variety of issues, but especially higher input costs. 55% of farmers surveyed say they now plan to purchase less machinery in the upcoming year. And big news in the ag equipment auction business, Big Iron Auctions has acquired Sullivan Auctioneers, merging the two companies. As two of the largest online auction houses in the industry, the business will now go by Big Iron Company and be headquartered in Hamilton, Illinois. A news release says the deal will bring roughly 300 employees together. A Missouri man is facing a charge of attempted murder for allegedly shooting at a crop dusting plane. A news release from the Caldwell County Sheriff's Office says that 62-year-old Donald Bates Jr. of Kidder, Missouri was taken into custody last week. The Kansas City Star reports that court papers say the incident happened near farmland outside of Kidder. Police started investigating after a report of a small plane struck by gunfire. The pilot saying he was spraying crops at the time and thought he had collided with something in the air. When he landed, he found the fuel tank had been hit by a bullet causing a leak. Another bullet hole was spotted in the nose of the plane. Bates is being held without bond right now. Grain markets were spooked by tensions in Taiwan and recent rains. We'll dig into some market strategy next with Michelle Rook. And later, the state fair is a great place to see animals get wonderful food and ride rides, but it's also a perfect place to get some good information. Meet the gardening masters in Tennessee in the country. Ag Day is brought to you by The End Zone by Farm Shop MFG, which allows you to rehydrate your soybeans from 10 to 13 percent. On a 20,000 bushel bin, that's an extra semi-load added to your bottom line. Order your End Zone fan control by August 31st and receive $200 off. Bayer is buying a majority stake in an ag startup. The company's called Covercress. Now, Covercress is a rotational winter oilseed crop that can be planted as a cover. Now, it adds another harvest option for the spring just ahead of planting summer crops. Oil from the grain has a low carbon intensity score and it can be turned into renewable diesel. Earlier this year, Covercrest said it was entering into a long-term deal with Bungie to process grain from its crop into renewable fuels. Bayer says Covercrest will operate as an independent company following the acquisition. It's been a big numbers game for the markets lately with several economic reports to digest. Ag Day's Michelle Rook looks into the impact on ag. Joining us with today's market analysis is Arlen Suderman with Stonex Group. Arlen, we've had a lot of information from an economic standpoint thrown at the markets. GDP, second quarter, we've had uh, the Fed raising interest rates. What does all this mean for agriculture? What are you watching? Well, for one thing, it was good to see the outside markets calm down last week. Um, that allows the grain and oilseed markets to trade the fundamentals more rather than just getting whipsawed based on money flow and fear and panic, which we've seen so much of lately and I'm sure we're going to see again. And that allowed them to focus on the weather market. And we had, because of that fear factor, we had liquidated, seen the funds liquidate so many commodities, the prices got cheap and they suddenly said, you know, this story's still there. We still need a hedge against inflation and now we can buy in at a lower price. So that was beneficial to them. But inflation is with us to stay. I've heard a lot of talk about inflation. Oh, it's in the back rear view window because commodities have fallen so much. And so our inflation problem is behind us. But look at just what gasoline prices did last week, up over 50 cents from the previous week on the futures. Uh, you talked about what soybean prices did, corn prices going up. We're seeing many of the commodities come back again as they refocus on the supply and demand fundamentals. The structural issues behind this inflation is still in place. We haven't fixed that. We've done very little to withdraw money supply. In the PCE data that came out last week, we saw personal consumption up over 1% over in the last quarter. Um, even though income's down, we saw wages and, and the 
employee expenditures, of wage inflation essentially up 5.1% year on year in the last quarter. So the inflation story is still there and the funds are starting to realize that and come back into the commodities to hedge against it. Do they come back in like they were before or not? Oh, that's the key that I'm watching. We saw a lot of index fund liquidation. The CFTC to C data is always delayed. We are seeing evidence of them starting to come back in. Will they come back to the level they were? That's going to depend on the economic data coming forward and how these outside markets behave. Um, but at least we're focused now on some of the fundamental factors, which I think producers and end users would prefer that they focused yeah. on. Absolutely. It was really frustrating to watch the disconnect. Thanks so much for joining us. Arlen Suderman with StoneX Group. More Ag Day coming up. Contact Arlen Suderman by email at arlen.suderman at intlfcstone.com. Ag Day is brought to you by MetLife Investment Management's Agricultural Finance Group. MetLife Investment Management is positioned to help you grow your business with a competitive farm, ranch, and agribusiness loan. To learn more, visit investments.metlife.com backslash agriculture. Meteorologist Matt Urasavik joining us here. Take a look at our national forecast. And Matt, obviously, we've made our, made our way into August, but still very hot and humid. Oh, yeah, and it's going to continue to be that way. This ridge really not letting up anytime soon. We've got those temperatures still feeling at or over 100 degrees, and that's going to continue through the second half of the week. And you can see that jet stream still well to the north here as we head through the day on Wednesday. And if you put this into motion, even heading a little bit farther towards the end of the week, a lot of heat starting to slide off again towards the east coast. Starting to see a little bit of a dip there in the jet stream. A few more showers and storms possible in the northern Rockies for the end of the week, but still hot and humid with some of those pop-up thunderstorms back to the west through the uh, end of the week there. And then heading in through the weekend, Again, much of the same jet streams not coming any farther down to the south. It's keeping that heat, that humidity all across the lower 48. Just a little dip in the jet stream looks possible next week in the northeast, and that could be a little relief from some of this heat. But look at the temperatures this afternoon, 90s and triple digits all the way from uh, parts of the Great Lakes back into the center of the country and even up into the northern plains. And then as you head towards tomorrow morning, you can really see who's going to be warm and humid all the way up from the Great Lakes back into the center of the country where we've got low temperatures in the lower 70s, even low 80s across parts of Oklahoma and Texas. And then temperatures, same thing tomorrow afternoon, a little bit lower than uh, what we saw the day yesterday or today in parts of the Great Lakes with some showers and storms rolling through. But the middle of the country is still going to be hot and humid, especially in the northern plains. Here's a look at uh, those heat index values or with a feels like temperature. 100 is what it's going to feel like there in Chicago. 170 in St. Louis and 105 down in Dallas, Texas. So very hot through the middle of the country. And then again, that shower and thunderstorm threat. A few of those storms could be strong to severe from northern Michigan all the way back toward Kansas City and Wichita. And main threats really going to be gusty winds and heavy rain. Excessive rainfall possible here. Upwards of two to four inches locally could fall from parts of Michigan all the way back to parts of Missouri. So that could be something that we need to watch. And it's really this cold front right here, which is going to produce that line of showers and storms and then continue moving it through. That keeps things unsettled though, right through here in the Great Lakes and the Midwest heading through Thursday, but then things clear out and move eastward as we head through Friday. Still could be looking at some isolated spots again, seeing two to four inches of rain right there in the Great Lakes and the Midwest. And we'll continue to track that right here on Ag Day. That's a look around the country. Now let's take a look at the weather where you live. South Bend, Indiana, hot, humid, windy with evening thunderstorms, a high near 94 degrees. Billings, Montana, hot and muggy, a high near 96. And Farmington, New Mexico, sunny and hot with an isolated storm, a high near 93. Global pork demand is pretty solid this year, but it could get even better. We'll look at the latest reports coming up next and meet the masters answering gardening questions at the Tennessee State Fair today in the country. A new report says global pork trade should pick up in the second half of this year. Robo Bank's Robo Research saying some easing in feed costs and resilient consumer demand are improving market prospects. But it says challenges remain, including African swine fever and inflation that's impacting those trade policies. 
One analyst says global pork trade is expected to increase mainly due to an expected rise in import demand from China. Now he says that pork prices in China have increased greatly in the past month and are expected to stay high in the second half of the year, which supports imports. Other countries, such as Japan, also expect imports to remain firm. An amazing and bittersweet moment at the Porter County, Indiana Fair 4-H Livestock Auction as a 300-pound reserve grand champion breeding gilt sold for $102,000. Now take a look. We have $340 a pound. 345 Anybody else? Sold it. Why so high? The donors wanted to honor a woman and her family who had given so much to the community around Valparaiso, who was fighting a courageous battle against colon cancer. Now the woman's name, Ashley Dutlinger. That's her son, Hudson, walking his guilt around the sale ring. Now by the time the sale was over, 116 donations had been made and they were treated as a collective buyer at the auction. Ashley's husband, along with their two sons, Hudson and Brooks, and other family members and friends on hand as the sale was made and paid tribute to Ashley. Thank you for being two of the most wonderful, loving, and supportive children in the community. Every time we see the kindness you share, we truly see the spirit of your mom. Now, Ashley passed away just three days after the sale, and the giving hasn't stopped. Since the auction night, donations have continued to roll in, with a final sale price ending up and more than $120,000, a world record for a crossbred guilt. To learn more about Ashley, her family, and this record sale, make sure to read this story on farmjournalsporkbusiness.com. If you're tending a garden, there are always questions that crop up. We'll meet some of the masters of mulch and gardeners of greatness answering those questions in Tennessee next. Registration is open for the 2022 Pro Farmer Crop Tour. Join our team as we gain insight on the 2022 growing season in person or online. Visit profarmercroptour.com forward slash register to select the stop nearest you. Where do backyard gardeners turn when they have questions about growing produce, plants, and flowers? As Charles Denny reports in Tennessee, they just head to a booth at their local fair and ask a master gardener. A summer Saturday in Jackson Square in Oak Ridge is full of people shopping and browsing, downright squirrely. These folks are here for the Lavender Festival, where you can buy the plant the event is named for and lots of other flowers and crafts. Um, it celebrates health, herbs, and the environment, and of course, lavender. We have about 135 vendors plus the farmer's market today. That's another big draw here, the opportunity to shop for beautiful produce or even find information about what's growing in your own yard or garden. That's where UT Extension in Anderson County steps in, hosting this Ask a Master Gardener booth at the festival and market. They can also stop by and ask maybe if they had a question about uh, maybe turf or maybe their own tomatoes are developing some, you know, lesions on their, on their fruits there. So. Uh, uh, we help uh, diagnose issues like that and, and give them a good uh, research-based answer. Agents like Seth Whitehouse are on hand, as well as some of the volunteers he's trained with Extension's Master Gardener program. Whitehouse wants his MGs to not just be green thumbers, but knowledgeable experts themselves. Jenny Bessine enjoys the exchange with fellow gardeners. People come with questions and if we don't have the answers or don't know the answers, we ask them to send a picture of what the problem is and uh, send it to the Extension Service and they will help diagnose that. The Tennessee Master Gardener program now includes more than 2,700 volunteers statewide. Pre-pandemic, they were doing 200,000 hours of service each year. And now those groups are becoming more and more active again. One project for the Anderson Group was just down the road from the festival site, the St. Mary's Parish Food Bank, and growing a garden here. The project helps hundreds of people each week who are food insecure. Fresh produce is one of the missing pieces for them, so we can supply collards and tomatoes and cucumbers and zucchini all throughout the season. 
So whether we're talking food for people in need or just making your community a more attractive place, master gardeners can have an impact. And if it grows in the ground and you have an issue or question about it, just ask. This is Charles Denny reporting. All right, thanks Charles, and that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Ag Dam, Clint Griffiths, have a great day. Out in the farm.